And again, welcome. Um, I am the founder of 100 Real Women, and um, I am so excited to have um, the honor of um, having U.S. Senator, um, former U.S. Senator Heidi Hadkamp joining us this morning to share about the offices that she's served in, you know, what the jobs are really like, and of course, why it's important to have more women serving in elected office and supporting each other. Um, so Heidi, so a special thanks to you for joining so, us so bright and early. 100 Rural Women is really, you know, simply really about creating uh, connections and inspiring leadership. And we also believe in empowering and supporting the next generation of leaders. And, and in that regard and in that vein, it's just my pleasure this morning to introduce our facilitators for the morning. and. Um, I just want to welcome you um, all and tell you about these amazing young women who are going to lead us through the, today as we kick off our uh, Civic Mentorship Network and our Learn About It sessions. So I want to introduce Jasmine Terry, and Jasmine is our graduate student from the University of Minnesota, and she's just starting out and starting, um, she's going to be studying um, school psychology and God bless her, she's interested in middle school and high school. So really excited to have Jasmine with us and Lindsay Romlin. And Lindsay is a senior at the University of Minnesota Morris and is a business student. And um, I'm just gonna hand it right over to these young women to take us forward. And again, I'll probably say this a million times, but I so appreciate your time this morning, Heidi. Thanks for joining us. So Jasmine, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, hello everybody. As Teresa said, I am the graduate student working with 100 Rural Women here. I actually have a unique story. I came on in my undergrad uh, career as an intern and I stayed with 100 Rural Women for a little bit last year and then I graduated and then I went to grad school and I saw they had an opening for a graduate research assistant and I signed up and now I'm here. I just can't get enough of 100 Rural Women. So I'm going to start this meeting kind of discussing a little bit about 100 Rural Women and what these Learn About sessions are. So 100 Rural Women is a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization interested in providing resources to support and serve rural women. We envision a world where more rural women lead positive change for themselves, their families, communities, the nation, and the world. We aim to achieve this by identifying and creating relationships, networking, leadership, mentorship, and civic engagement. We actually just completed over 100 meetings across the state of Minnesota as part of our 100 in 100 project, where we learned from and listened to women. This resulted in over 3,000 requests for support from women. Building from this engagement and research, we are now in the process of creating and building a civic mentorship network with the end goal of engaging 100 rural elected women to mentor 100 rural women to pursue public services and, in addition, providing public service and voter education. This spring, we were also fortunate enough to work with three graduate students at the U of M Humphrey Schools on a capstone project called April 2022, The Barriers, Breakthroughs, and Backbones of Elected Rural Women. In this project, the graduate students conducted several interviews with elected women and learned a lot from these interviews. We are now holding these informational slash educational meetings called Learn About It. So welcome. These are, this is the beginning stage of our civic mentorship network. If anyone is interested and, know, and knows any woman interested in public office and is looking for a mentor, we will be providing a survey after these sessions for you to fill out and indicate your interest. If you have any friends that are unable to attend, as Teresa said, we are recording these meetings and we'll be posting them on our website so they can take a look there. So let's get started. We will first be introducing our speaker today, and then you'll get to hear from her directly. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat as we go. Otherwise, we will be holding space towards the end of the session for you to either raise your hand and ask the questions or post them in the chat. If you don't feel comfortable, please just DM Caitlin and she'll be able to ask the question for you. All right, today we have the opportunity to hear from former U.S. Senator and attorney Heidi Heitkamp. Heidi served as the first female U.S. Senator elected from North Dakota in 2013 to 2019. Prior to her term as Senator, Heidi served as North Dakota's Attorney General and the state's Tax Commissioner. 
Today, she is the founder and chair of the One Country Project. This organization focuses on addressing the needs and concerns of rural America. She also serves on the boards of the McCain Institute and the Howard Buffett Foundation. Further, she is the senior fellow in international and public affairs at Brown University and also serves as a contributor to CNBC and ABC News. Please give a warm welcome to Heidi Heitkamp. Thanks so much. And I, I want to make my comments fairly uh, quickly because as Teresa has said, um, you know, there is uh, uh, always a lot of questions and we want to get it to that as quickly as possible. But, you know, I had kind of an interesting trajectory in politics. I didn't grow up in politics. My parents, uh, uh, we, I grew up in a small town in the southeast corner of North Dakota. I always tell people, look, I grew up closer to Minneapolis than I did to Bismarck. Um, uh, my grandmother was involved as a volunteer for the Democratic NPL party, and uh, we would occasionally pick potatoes and peel potatoes and, uh, you know, do the sweet corn for the corn and potato feeds that she would uh, provide the food for, but that is about as close growing up as what I got to politics. Um, you know, I got interested in politics through public policy. Uh, I went to the University of North Dakota, where I basically majored in political science, but got very interested in the environmental movement, um, uh, spent a, a, an internship in Washington, DC in 1976, eventually went to law school in a law school that specialized in environmental law and went back to Washington, DC. And my aha moment where I, I realized that being involved in public policy has uh, has no effect if you don't get involved in politics was the Ronald Reagan election where he literally upended all of environmental law enforcement. And so here I thought, oh, if you pass a law, of course that that's you know, gonna be enforced. And um, you know, I found out that political politics matters and I moved back to North Dakota. Um, and uh, when I moved back to North Dakota, I swore that I would get involved like a lot of you you know, be somebody who would volunteer and work on campaigns and then got convinced to run for office. And we can talk a little bit about that as we explore some of the questions that um, that we uh, that I've been given. But I just wanted to say that that I think that we all come to this in a different way. And the one thing that I would tell you, I think motivates and distinguishes women in politics is so many of them come to it on an issue, you know, something that they cared about, that the political system failed, whether it is gun rights, whether it's abduction of children, whether it is, you know, kind of access to daycare, whether it is quality education. Women typically know why they've gotten involved in politics, as opposed to, I'm a really smart guy and uh, I'd like to be in leadership. Um, and you know, I don't want to pick on any particular gender, but um, you'll hear that a lot more from men than you will women. What you'll hear from women typically is they shut down the kindergarten in my hometown and that made me mad. Um, you know, I, 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 I couldn't bear watching children struggle to um, afford hot lunch. And, and so I ran for the school board. So typically women are, are much more issue oriented. They come to politics from issues. Yeah, thank you so much, Heidi. So we're gonna go into a couple of questions that are gonna cover your offices that you've run, you've been in. So you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on why you decided to run for office. Well, I, I didn't decide to run because I, I was discouraged. I, I decided to get involved in politics. Making the decision to run is a whole different kind of, um, uh, uh, situation and a whole different decision-making process. I got roped into it. I mean, to be honest, um, Kent Conrad, who a lot of uh, people on my side, on the Western side of Minnesota will remember was our sitting United States Senator. But at the time he was tax commissioner and I was working for Kent. And Kent, I remember, uh, uh, took me out to lunch and, and basically said, well, I think you should run for state auditor. And I started laughing. I said, you know, I, I, I'm training for the 5K, not the marathon. Um, and, and at the time I was training for a 5K. And, and, and he was like, no, I think you'd be really good. And it was 1984. And in 1984, um, 
you know, was the first kind of year of the woman, right? Um, Geraldine Ferrara and, and I had gotten involved with the Democratic NPL Women's Caucus, um, which basically said, we want women on the statewide ticket. And I had been going all over trying to recruit women to do it and got the same answer. You think it's a good idea, you do it. Um, and so eventually was drafted at the convention to run for state auditor. And um, it was that race that I credit a lot of my future success. But the thing I always remember about that is I had a lot of male mentors and I said, oh, all these women kept coming up the convention saying, I'll help you. If you do this, I'll help you. And they go, oh yeah, they always say that that help won't be there. And um, I will tell you every woman who said she would help me was there. And I went into their communities. It was kind of a building of our time to work for someone who looks more like us. Um, and so I, I lost a very narrow race for state auditor. And when Kent was elected to the United States Senate, I was appointed. And that that's the other thing is sometimes a loss just looks like a loss. Um, uh, it, it, it can be very important kind of um, uh, not stepping stone, but a very important experience that will prepare you for the next step. And so um, I was asked to be the uh, next tax commissioner, which may not sound very glamorous to all of you, but it was in fact our two sitting, uh, Byron, who was the congressman at the time, was a former tax commissioner and Kent was a former tax commissioner. So it was, it was really perceived to be a pretty high pro profile position. And so I, I knew that when I accepted that position, I had made a commitment to run, um, eventually ran for attorney general, a job that I will tell you, I loved as much as any job I've ever had. And we could talk about the, the wonderful experience I had there and then ran for governor in 2000 and lost um, in, a, in a race where you could start sense that North Dakota was turning. Um, but also was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer in September of that campaign. Um, uh, left politics after that and then came back after 12 years. So that's another lesson. You can lose, but um, stay active and engaged and involved. And uh, I saw polarization. I saw the Tea Party and said, you know, I just can't sit on the sidelines. And um, I was the surprise victory in the 2012 campaign for the United States Senate. It sounds like you've lived a life, Heidi. <laughs> so um, thinking about these offices, if you just want to talk about each one or if there's one specific one you want to touch on, what do you do in those offices? What does an average day look like for you? Well, you know, a lot of people would say that the tax department, uh, your job is just to administer the taxes, to make sure that people get their refunds, make sure everybody pays their fair share. But it, when I was tax commissioner, I had an amazing opportunity to be involved in tax policy. Um, that is a background that I, I started out life as an environmental lawyer, did not intend to become a tax lawyer in any way, shape or form. They're very similar in that they're highly regulatory. So they kind of aren't as dissimilar as what you might think in terms of the kind of practice, a lot of administrative law, a lot of um, uh, appeals to the North Dakota Supreme Court. So an opportunity very early um, in my career as a lawyer to argue cases in the Supreme Court. But when I was in the tax department, I not only um, kind of uh, led efforts for tax equality in North Dakota, doing a taxpayer bill of rights, which wasn't mandated um, uh, by statute, I just thought it was important that people be treated fairly, not based on who they were, but um, based on their, their equal circumstance. Um, I'll give you a for instance there. Um, for instance, if you called and asked for a waiver of penalty, the state, the tax department's policy was, if you asked, we would waive a certain amount. Well, if people didn't know to ask, or if they didn't have a lawyer to ask, of course, then they paid the penalty. And I thought that was grossly unfair. Um, that, that people who would be represented by uh, people who they paid um, got a better shake than people who just simply filed their tax return. I did a lot of work with small businesses who had sales tax permits to get that with SCORE to try and get them some additional assistance. So if they fell behind in their, in their um, filing for, for uh, sales tax, but 
They were great people, worked in your communities, a lot of them in rural America. They hate the paperwork. They love doing the body work on the cars or they love you know, doing the, the, the work to uh, keep all of us in our great hairdos, but they really had very little business experience. So we created a program to connect them to um, uh, SCORE, which is a senior um, uh, executive kind of um, uh, leadership group, uh, business people who help mentor entrepreneurs and young business people. And so, you know, uh, on the flip side of that, I worked very, uh, I, I was in very high profile national positions. I took a case to the Supreme Court that has since been reversed. It was the Quill case. It was the catalog uh, uh, at the time catalog of remote sales uh, you know, should Amazon collect your sales tax? Um, they The reason why they didn't for years was because of a case that we took that we weren't able to get longstanding precedent reversed. But that was a really big deal to, and, and probably still is one of, in the last 50 years, that line of cases is one of the most significant line of cases um, in taxation. It's, it's certainly state taxation. And so, you know, from, from, from helping the smallest person you know, uh, with with something they hated, which was taxes, making sure that we were responsive, making sure that we understood that work to the to the um, big policy issues, whether it was worldwide unitary or uh, mail order remote sales tax collection, had just this amazing experience. But probably more than anything else, it got me out into North Dakota. Um, it also taught me that people aren't going to like you no matter what, and you're just going to have to suck it up. And so those of you who say, "Why well, I only want a job where people like me, don't go into politics because that, that they will find a reason not to like you. Um, the, the famous story that I tell from the tax department is right after I got elected, they went to a, um, they went to a, uh, 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 for the first time mandated uh, quarterly uh, income tax payments. It was a long story, but um, this woman called me because we had gotten a list from the IRS um, to notify people um, of people who had filed quarterly for the IRS, and, and her name was misspelled. And she called me, got a hold of me, and just yelled at me for 20 minutes. Absolutely, I'm not kidding you about how I, if I didn't know her name and you know, and I kept thinking, what could have I done differently? I was brand new, wanted to do everything perfectly. And about halfway through that conversation, I, I came to my, what I call the Heidi rule of people one, which is if she's irrationally yelling at you, she irrationally yells at everybody and you just have to take it and not take it personally. And, and so I think that's, a, that's a, a great lesson that I took from that, which was at the ripe old age of, I think I was probably 29, um, you know, doing that work. Plus the one thing I would tell you is probably no office better prepared me for the work that I've done since. Um, I feel like I am a subject matter expert on taxation. Um, uh, I like kind of that business world. And, you know, as a CNBC contributor, frequently people are asking about, well, what about the capital gains rate? What about this? I, I feel completely prepared um, to uh, step into that world of, uh, of tax policy. Uh, Attorney General, North Dakota's Attorney General has a complicated role. Uh, about a third of it is on the Industrial Commission, which runs the Bank of North Dakota. About a third of it is running law enforcement agency, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and the other third is really being a lawyer. And I love that job because um, it gave me that diversity of experience. I probably tend to be um, a little, uh, uh, for what it's worth, a little um, ADHD. Um, I'm one of these people who likes about five projects going at one time. And so to have the stimulus of a lot of different kinds of experiences. Now, every AG's office is going to be different. Um, but uh, for me, it was a very diverse, amazing experience. Um, being Senator, I'm sure you guys uh, can imagine it's, it's uh, the, the church of what's happening today. Um, you know, one of my problems with the Senate is there is little, very little long range planning. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know it may surprise you that I spent most of my time talking about um, tax commissioner, but I did that for you all because you probably have a pretty good idea what attorneys general do, pretty good idea what, what um, a United States Senator does, but there are other opportunities in public policy and don't ignore those opportunities 
to become the state auditor, to become you know the county executive, to to take a look at county commission, school board, you know they they're they're underappreciated, um, uh, and and so 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 important to our democracy. Thank you. I definitely learned a little bit more about tax commissioner. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> So um, when you think about being attorney general, tax commissioner, and the U.S. senator, what are the benefits to these, not only like financially, but in other ways as well? Well, I mean, typically, I was just reading a, a blog post where um, Business Insider just did a, an event with um, six Congress people who resigned early, you know, who were on leadership track or who could have clearly been reelected who left. Most of them left because it's not financially as lucrative as um, working on the outside. So if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for an experience that will pay you well, um, and I'm not complaining about $174,000. That's a, but you're running two households, and and for many people at that point in their career, they probably could be have an experience where or have a work experience where they're getting paid more. Um, but so so I just want to. I just want to say most of the people don't do it for the money. Um, you know, back in the day when, you know, in the 80s, when I got involved in politics, uh, uh, senators and congressmen could take honoraria. It was um, really unethical, in my opinion. It's still being done by the Supreme Court. By the way, if you want to look at a Supreme Court reform, they should not be allowed to be have receive any outside compensation. Um, and, and, and the transparency on that is horrible, but, uh, but that's an aside. Um, the, the, the motivation is really two things. Number one, having the joy of service. And I, I'm not somebody who says, oh, I wanted to give back. I always say, well, who said anybody wanted what you had to give? I mean, it, it's a, there's an arrogance to people saying, I want to give back because those of us who have done things in service know how that makes you feel it, how important that is to, to who we are as uh, members of the human race. I always say, we learned this when, when my dad used to make us, when we had a snowstorm, my dad used to make us go down and shovel out Mrs. Poster's walk and Mrs. Uh, 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 Mrs. Pitts's walk because their kids lived a long way away and they went to church every morning. And so we'd be the first people up you know, with shovels in the neighborhood. And, you know, did we resent it at times? Yeah, but we always felt really good when it was done. Like we had done something really important that morning and, and helped somebody. And so I think that that lifelong lesson of being in a position to really help people has been uh, um, important. Um, Andy Shaw, when you, when you look at, and, and I, the stories I tell from the Senate are not stories about, you know, doing some bank reform, doing some, you know, big energy policies, voting on um, immigration reform, which unfortunately wasn't taken up by the House. Those are all great memories. But one of my favorite memories of serving in the Senate is there is a, a Korean War vet who was part of what they called the Tiger March. He was enrolled uh, is a, a Dakota um, from uh, Spirit Lake and his name was Andy Shaw and he was a pipe maker, which for those of you who, who um, understand the, the importance of that in indigenous culture know that he was a holy man, but he had never gotten his purple heart because he was interned. And he was basically put in, in a North Korean prison during the time of the war and uh, didn't have his wounds verified. And so um, his family got a hold of us. He was getting uh, up in age and really wanted to um, resolve this problem. And so uh, my staff person, I give her all the credit in the world, woman by the name of Renee Arfer, um, scoured the, the records and really worked at trying to um, uh, find somebody who knew somebody and uh, who knew him. And eventually we were able to get him his Purple Heart. And we went to the ceremony um, at, uh, up at um, Fort Totten and to watch his face as he stood from his wheelchair, saluting the flag and hugging his purple heart. Nothing better than that, nothing better than that. And so understand that most of these jobs 
the memories you will have are not always the big, big things that get done. And certainly being a United States Senator, one of a hundred making that kind of policy in that body. Um, but the joy that I took from so many of my jobs was helping the individual person through a tough time or to, to a joyous celebration. Heidi, those are amazing and diverse experiences. Thank you so much for sharing with us. We're gonna kick off into questions. If anyone has an, any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or ask them in the chat. I will kick off with a question. Um, as a young woman, like approaching joining the workforce, what in your opinion is an important school, a skill or attribute to have when um, seeking leadership roles? Thick skin. Yeah, uh, you know, you you have to you have to learn, you have to be open to criticism, but you also have to not let it wound you. I think if I went back and said what I, it, it made me stronger thinking all the time. I always tell people I used to win elections by you know sixty five percent, and I would ask why don't the other thirty five percent like me. And you know that can drive you crazy when you're trying to be all things to all people. Or if somebody called you up and yelled at you, you you'd feel bad for a couple of days. And you know, so so what I would just say is, be certain, listen to legitimate criticism, and discard and and toughen up. Um, and I think young women are are hesitant to get involved because they don't want that criticism. And you know, you you are in a culture now where it's so easy to bully. Um, uh, you know, growing up and, you know, my, my great Jasmine, you know, a great uh, middle school counselor can make all the difference in, in a young, especially a young girl's life. Uh, middle school is a particularly tough time. And so I think we get very sensitized to criticism. And so I would say toughen up, you know, uh, 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 and, and uh, go to your moms and your grandmas and your grand uh, and your, um, aunties and, and uh, you know, build a network of support and people who will, who will tell you the truth. That's legitimate criticism. You should pay attention to that. Or people say, stop it. That's that you're giving them way too much of your life and your concern. That's great insight. Um, RG has a question. Um, are there any additional thoughts on how she can encourage her students to both want to serve rural areas and or how to consider other paths? Um, you know, I, I, it's so tough. My, wh what I wanna say is there is, it, rural America is a amazing place because anybody who wants to be in leadership can find a way to do it. I, I mean, I believe that. Um, I think it's much tougher to be, uh, you know, the county commissioner of Hennepin County with all the money that that costs than it is to be the county commissioner in Ottertail County. Um, uh, but for some reason, women don't seek that kind of leadership. And so I, I get discouraged. I've been uh, involved with the rural electrification, uh, rural telecom movement. And it always discourages me when I go to meetings and I look around a table and there's not one woman sitting at that table in leadership. Um, there's no reason for that. Women are, in fact, overrepresented in rural population. You know, I always say, look, you can you can play basketball on a Class B team if you could never play basketball in uh, at Fargo's Davies. Um, the same is true, but you have to dribble the ball. You have to get in the fight. Um, and you know, we just did. We have a program that my sister and some of her friends started up in Grand Forks. It's called ERA Now. Um, and it was started after Donald Trump was elected um, to kind of just what is going on with women's voices, especially rural women's voices. And um, they just did a whole seminar on the, what's happening with um, uh, violence against political candidates and how to kind of diffuse that violence, how to, uh, you know, kind of navigate that space. If you had told me 20 years ago when I got involved in politics that um, we would have to do seminars on how to protect your family. I would have, I mean, how to protect your family against bad words, yes, but against physical violence, no. And so I think um, it's particularly troubling in rural places where if you, let's say you're a little more progressive, your attitudes are more progressive, you're more isolated. 
Um, and so there are different and unique challenges. But to me, um, uh, there is also unique opportunities and, and the ability to step up uh, and uh, come from kind of nowhere. By that, I mean nowhere politically, which is what I did in North Dakota, and then eventually be elected to the United States Senate. I think that that was only possible in a state that's as rural as North Dakota, where you can get to know people. So it, it's, yes, pluses and minuses in rural representation. That's great. As someone who's very passionate about rural America, that is amazing insight. Um, to kind of go off of what you were talking about, Theora asks, Oh, wait, I'm kidding. Don asks, many people elected to state or national office have law degrees. How important is that degree to work in, in an elected office? That's becoming less and less. I mean, it used to be that the majority of people in the Senate were lawyers. I don't think that's true anymore. Um, you know, uh, I think backgrounds like nursing, like education, teaching, I, I, I wish we had more, more kindergarten teachers in the United States Senate. They know how to handle a rowdy group. Um, I, I, so, so I think it's less and less. What's interesting is that um, I noticed that the University of Washington in St. Louis is offering a non-lawyer law degree. By that, I mean, here, you wanna understand the law, we'll teach you about the law, even if you don't wanna become a lawyer. Um, I raise that not because I think you all should go there. I raise that because there's a way to educate yourself on how to make laws, how to understand the laws without being a lawyer. And, and so to me, um, just as I believe gender diversity, age diversity are critical in our elected bodies, I think occupational um, uh, diversity is absolutely critical. Um, so to me, the, the, the last qualification you should be worried about is a law degree. Um, we all come with different life experiences and those life experiences have value in the, in the public policy decision-making arena. That's awesome. And I think that a lot of people, including myself, think that's sometimes a barrier. Uh, Caitlin has her hand raised. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, just kind of going back to when you talked about how um, you were interested in environment and environmental policy. That is exactly the area that I'm especially interested in. Um, I'm going to school for mass communications, public relations, and then my two minors are sustainability and political science. And my main goal is to get within a realm in which I can be involved within environment and um, environmental policy. And specifically more as I've progressed, as I've gotten older, being able to see the different ways that environmental policy and just how rural areas suffer a lot environmentally and the side effects, especially that we can get from urban areas. So I was just curious um, what advice you would give to someone such as myself who's looking to enter into that realm and just kind of where to start because there are a lot of different areas that I can go into and um, I didn't know if you had any specific areas that you were a big fan of. Well I'm, I'm a big fan of grassroots organizations, um, organizations that work at, 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 at a level that actually has impact and educates. I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing some work with the bi-policy, uh, bipartisan policy center on natural climate solutions. So we just issued a big report and we'll continue to advocate for that report. Um, and it basically looks at what, what should we be doing in the climate space in uh, rural America, whether it's in forestry or whether it's in agriculture. And what, what I would tell you from that experience is that that the most important thing you can be involved in is attitudes and education. Um, you know, when I started, when I was, even when I started in the, in the United States Senate, if you had talked about natural climate solutions to a farmer in North Dakota, you probably would not have spent a lot of time talking to him. He would have walked away or she would have walked away because they see this as really a barrier. I think more and more they're seeing it, number one, as essential, but also as an opportunity. And so I think there's, and that's been a lot of work from a lot of people kind of, um, whether it is 
organizations like the corn growers basically adopting and saying, yes, we need to pay attention to climate. We think something is happening out there. So it's kind of evolutionary, not revolutionary. The aha moment has come very slowly in a lot of, a lot of spaces. So it's, it's, it's a broad area. Um, you know, obviously, I don't think you're interested in urban planning, um, which is a to me, I think, an overlooked environmental area. But but I think that um, this it, it is so broad that I think it's important for you to really think about what policies you want to work on. Is it climate? Is it um, confined hog operations and pollution runoff? And you know, is it clean water? Is it clean air? You know, it, and that may sound like I'm overcomplicating it. I don't think I am. Um, so to me, there are tons of internships. There's tons of opportunities to participate with, with grassroots organizations, but there also are um, great organizations like uh, uh, that do public policy, not law school. I obviously chose law school as a, as a um, way to kind of, because it was at the time probably the only only uh, place to go, um, and not that I regret going to law school, but I went to Lewis and Clark, which is a law school that's very well known for environmental law. And, and it, it is, um, there are so many opportunities. And so what I would just suggest to you is that you really focus on what your interests are, what your skill sets are, and then make yourself indispensable. Um, I, I could give you my, my daughter's trajectory. She was very interested in the privacy realm on, on the internet. Um, she just started volunteering with organizations in Washington, D.C. that did privacy work, networked her way into a job at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and eventually moved to, um, uh, to San Francisco to be involved at a very high level in privacy discussions. But that all started from volunteering at events, uh, privacy events in Washington. So you know how you how you do this. Um, really, there there's no set path except the certainty of your commitment. Does that make sense? That was great. Thank you. You bet. Good luck. That's amazing. Uh, Darcy has her hand raised. Do you have a question? And this will be our final question. Oh, thank you. And I, I truly enjoy, I am not a rural woman. However, I grew up in a rural community and actually very close to where Heidi grew up, um, just a few miles down the road. And, and I live in the Twin Cities now in an urban area, but one thing that um, when you're talking about opportunities and looking to where see your interests are, like I joined the Friends of the Mississippi, which was about taking care of our sewer systems and, and teaching my kids about where the water goes from our yard to the Mississippi River. And it really prompted me to understand how many lo local commissions there are, city commissions, the rural commissions, and that's where you can really get your start. And I've found that to be the best way to identify leaders um, and people that I wanna work with politically to get policies done that are important to me. So those are great opportunities um, going forward. And that's what I wanted to say, why I connect with this group and appreciate Teresa's work so much because it helped me identi identify how we as a state can all work together. Yeah, and, and, and you're, you're so right. I mean, I think of the Garrison Conservancy District in North Dakota, that's an elected position. Very seldom do, is there a lot of competition for those uh, positions. The Friends of, uh, we have uh, the, the, the water keepers in, in uh, North Dakota because we have an international situation in North Dakota where the Red River runs north. And so building leadership around water policy. But I, what I will tell you is, uh, Darcy is uh, the old saying, Whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. <laughs> you know, it, it, all of you be forewarned if you're going to get involved in water policy, especially in Western North, uh, Western North Dakota and Western America. It's the toughest politics there are. <laughs> so you may think, oh, you know, that sounds like a nice little group. Mm, not always. <laughs> so. Well, especially considering Heidi Word, like, the, the water rights are gonna be more and more and more yeah. important um, in future generations. So it's gonna be 
more palatable, but you're right. Whiskey is I, for drinking, water is for fighting. <laughs> yeah, I, I I talked to someone last night who said, you know, that when he was a, a young student and he was, he was probably my age, he said, people, his professor said, we'll never run out of water. And then we kind of like, he goes, no, no, no. What I mean is we'll never run out of cheap, or we, we will run out of cheap water. So, I mean, if you look at what Israel does and so water policy is, is a growing area. It should be it should be represented by young people who want to now conserve and good for you getting involved. Water policy is critical. Yeah, that's awesome. We are starting to run out of time. Um, just closing thoughts, Heidi. I'd love for you to mention why it's important for mentorship. Well, that, I just want to want to first off applaud Teresa. We we actually I knew nothing about this group, which is interesting. Um being uh but but I was invited to a seminar or to an event um in uh Bentonville because of my work with the One Country project. And I don't want to get into that just one country project. If you Google it, you'll find out about the work we're doing nationally to promote rural America. But Teresa told me about her her work here and I was fascinated by kind of this collective of women who could get together and really support each other um, in, a, in a broader sense, because you're not always gonna find that support looking left or right in a town of uh, 90 people. And so um, congratulations to all of you. I think, uh, uh, Teresa, as you're working to expand your, your uh, reach, you know, we're, we're there at One Country to help amplify what that is. Um, uh, we've, we've been sending the network out to uh, so many of our friends in Minnesota who, who feel isolated. And, and this is really where the next generation of good ideas, never mind leaders, but good ideas uh, for our states will come is, is at this level. And so I'm uh, happy to have done this today. Mentorship, uh, uh, you know, it, to me, it's what skills do you have that people want? And, and uh, I think uh, this kind of program is just invaluable. Um, and then, you know, like, like those women did years ago, those, those old envelope uh, uh, licking uh, stamp applying women who worked in politics who wanted to see someone who looked like them for the first time, like they, you know, shouldered me up. Uh, you, you have an opportunity, especially those of us who are on the later stages to really look at people like Jasmine and Lindsay and all the people here to, to say, what can we do to help that next generation of leaders? I love it. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. And this is interesting timing for us to be doing these learn, learn it sessions as we head into an election. So we're gonna pop some voting resources in the chat for people to remind them to learn about, you know, learn about how you can have best access to voting. And um, I, I just, I, Thank you. We we want folks to stay connected with 100 Row Women. This is just the beginning. We've been, you know, we're piloting and testing out different things to figure out how we can demystify paths to leadership for women. So everyone sees a path to leadership. And and you know, as Heidi talked today too, not maybe not everybody wants to serve an elected office, but maybe your neighbor does. What can you do to help her? So I think that's a whole piece of what we're trying to accomplish here. We also are going to post a survey in the chat of if you'd like to stay connected, please let us know. Um, you've attended today, so believe me, we have you on our mailing list. So look for look um, look for future information from us. We have a couple more um, Learn It sessions coming the last week of the month. We're going to be talking to a couple of county commissioners, and we're going to be talking to a town board um, supervisor, and uh, more to come. We have uh, we're going to hit every local office um, and elected office uh, um, that uh, is out there, so we can sort of talk about what those jobs are and um, why should we be interested in them and why we need more women in leadership. So thank you so much.